Good evening. Um, the summer is upon us, so we have a little bit of a lean group here, and it will probably be that way throughout the summer. Um, and it's a good thing that we're taping it on video because those who are away on vacation will be able to um, watch these tapes on video. And welcome to my friends from Facebook and YouTube. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, I'm going to start with a little story about the mystery of God's love and grace. It was 1945, World War II had drawn to a close and a young man sat broken inside a POW camp. He had been a reluctant soldier in Hitler's army. And here inside a prison in Scotland, he had months to contemplate what had been and what was to come. The cities of his homeland had been reduced to rubble and the people impoverished. His sleep was filled with repeating nightmares in which the terrors of warfare were lived over and over again. He writes, and then September of 1945 in Camp 22 in Scotland, we were confronted with pictures of Belzin and Auschwitz. They were pinned up in one of the huts without comment. Slowly, the truth filtered into our awareness and we saw ourselves mirrored in the eyes of the Nazi victims. Was this what we fought for? Had my generation as the last been driven to our deaths so that concentration camp murderers could go on killing and Hitler could live a few months longer? The depression over the wartime destruction and the captivity without any apparent end was exasperated by failings of profound shame in having to, dis to share this disgrace. That undoubt undoubtedly was the hardest thing, a stranglehold that choked us. An unshakable shame saturated his being and the only future he could see stretching out before him was the one filled with despair. Yet it was in the midst of this shame and despair that God found him. A visiting chaplain gave the soldier a Bible, and with little else to do, he began to read it. In it, he read the laments of the Psalms that resonated his voice, the agony of people who felt God had abandoned them. In the story of Christ's crucifixion, he encountered a God who knew what it was to experience suffering, abandonment, and shame. Feeling utterly forsaken himself, the German soldier found a friend in the one who cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In 1947, he was given permission to attend a Christian confer conference that brought together young people from across the world. The Dutch participants asked to meet the German POWs that had fought in the Netherlands. The young soldier was among them. He went to the meeting full of fear, guilt, and shame, feelings that intensified as the Dutch Christians spoke of the pain Hitler and his allies had inflicted, of the dread of the Gestapo, of the family and friends they had lost, of the disruption and damage of their communities. Yet, these Dutch Christians didn't speak out of a spirit of vindictiveness but they came to offer forgiveness. It was completely unexpected. These Dutch Christians embodied the love that the German soldier had read about in the story of Christ, and it turned his life upside down. He discovered, despite all that had passed, God was looking on us with the shining eyes of eternal joy. There was a future and a hope. The German soldier was Jürgen Maltmann, who would go on to become one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Years later, with a message of the loving crucified God still indelibly printed on his heart, he penned these beautiful words. But the ultimate reason for our hope is not found in all, at all in what we want, wish for, or wait for. For the ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. What is it that awaits us? 
Does anything await us at all, or are we alone? Well, whenever we base our hope on the trust in the divine mystery, we feel deep down in our hearts there is someone who is wanting for you, who is hoping for you, who believes in you. We are waited for like the prodigal son in the parable is waited for by the father. We are accepted and received as a mother takes her children into her arms and comforts them. God is our last hope because we are God's first love. And so in this story, we see this mystery of God's grace and love. We are saved, us sinners, we are saved by the grace of God. And this is quite a mystery. I think of the movie Forrest Gump where Mama tells Forrest this. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And so it is with mysteries. But if you've noticed lately that those box of chocolates, the candy manufacturers have actually put diagrams on them and they tell you what chocolate is in which section. So tonight, as we look at the mysteries of God, we are going to look into the Word of God, which is our diagram, to the revelation. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you for the mystery of your grace and your love and how you could love sinners like us, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for this portion in the book of Revelation. We pray you would open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and that we would hear the message that the Spirit wants to bring. We love you, Lord, and we praise you this day and we thank you for your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we left off last week where it said that another mighty angel came down from heaven and this angel was described as being clothed in a cloud and having a rainbow on his head and he was holding a little scroll. And it said in the scriptures that he was going to take authority over the land and the sea. And what we discovered is this may have been a direct message from God to the false prophet who will come up from the earth in Revelation 13 and to the Antichrist who will come out of the sea also in Revelation chapter 13. So here we see this mighty angel who is claiming the earth for the Lord. And so beginning at verse 5 it says this, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it, eat it, and it will, be, it, will, it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hands and I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So now we see this angel that's standing on the sea and the land. He raises his hands to heaven and he swears by the Lord who created all things. Now I believe that the angel is swearing by the Lord who created all things because he wants us to have a confidence and a trust in what he is about to say. And not only that, he wants John to trust the words that he is going to receive in him, that he is going to prophesy and speak out. Um, I love what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 6 about God's promises and oaths. And I'm going to read to you in a paraphrase right now. It says, Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 17, 
God also bound himself with an oath so that those he promised to help would be perfectly sure and never need to wonder whether he might change his plans. He has given us both his promise and his oath, two things we can completely count on. For it is impossible for God to tell a lie. Now all those who flee to him to, to him to save them can take new courage when they hear such assurances from God. Now they can know without a doubt that he will give them the salvation he has promised them. This certain hope of being saved is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, connecting us with God himself behind the sacred curtain of heaven where Christ has gone ahead to plead for us from his position as our high priest with the honor and the rank of Melchizedek. I love that. We can be confident that God will bring about his plan and his will, that it will not change, and that all of his promises are true. Well, I also see something very similar with the oath-taking in the book of Jan Daniel, chapter 7. And in this prophecy, it says, The man clothed in linen, who was above the water of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and a half time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be complete. So here we're seeing some more cues and clues to the end times coming in. It says here a phrase that is a time, times, and time and a half. Well, what this actually means in scripture is a time is one year. Times is two years. And of course, half time is a half a year. So if you add that together, what it comes out to is three and a half years. So many um, people that have studied uh, prophecy believe that this is the last seven years of the tribulation when the Antichrist will be ruling and reigning. In other words, it is the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Um, and here's another clue about the end times that we can be looking for. It says, when the power of the holy people has been shattered, all of these things shall be finished. And with the holy people they're referring to is Israel. So when it looks like Israel is completely crushed, then the end will come and the Messiah will come because Israel will have trusted in this Messiah to come and rescue them. They will have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, this mighty angel raises his hands to heaven, and what he says is that there should be delay no longer. And what he's saying here is what the saints wanted to hear in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, where they say, O oh Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth. It says that in Revelation chapter 6. They've been wanting to hear this because what happens in that chapter is they're given robes and they're, to they're told, you're going to have to wait a little while longer. There's going to be a delay. Well, right now, what is being said is there will not be a delay any longer. Now it's going to move forward. So this mighty angel is saying the, the, there will be no delay any longer. The time has come where the third trumpet, the, no, where the seventh trumpet, the third woe, will sound. And as that is sound, what's going to happen is there's going to be a release of seven bowls of judgment. And this is all to culminate the completing of God's plan for the judgment of the earth. And this is the answer that those tribulation saints were waiting to hear that the time is coming. Now to the believer who will be on the earth at that time that is running and hiding and waiting, it will be such a relief when this time floods in. But for those who do not know the Lord God as their savior, this will strike terror in their hearts. 
So now we see Daniel in verse 7. Um, <clears throat> Let me see. Now we see that there's going to be no more delays. It says in verse 7, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. This idea of mystery in Scripture is a very different idea than what we look at a mystery as, because we think of a mystery as something that we need to solve. But that's not the way it is biblically. Biblically, a mystery is something that can only be um, revealed. Um, it can't be discovered by intuition or personal investigation. A mystery is something that God will reveal. So there could be something known in the Bible, yet it can still remain a mystery because God needs to reveal that. Um, and it's hard to say what precisely this mystery is, so I was curious and I began looking in the scriptures and I found eight different mysteries in Christ. Um, now there's all different kinds of mysteries. There's the mystery of the lawlessness, there's the mystery of Babylon, but what I'm talking about here is associated with the mysteries that focus on Christ and his plan. So the first mystery about Christ and his plan is the mystery of the resurrection. And it tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed so there's a mystery there because we don't even know we can't even comprehend what that resurrected body is going to be like it's a mystery but it's a mystery that God is unfolding to us the second mystery is the mystery of Israel's blindness and that is from Romans eleven twenty five, and it says this for I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery Lest you, know, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there's a purpose, God is saying, in this mystery of the blindness of Israel. The third mystery that I looked at was the mystery of God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the age for our glory. And then there is the mystery of Christ and the church from Ephesians chapter 5, 31 through 32. It says this, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So God is telling us that this picture of marriage, of a man and woman coming together, is this mystery of how Christ is joined to the church and how we're joined to Christ. Then five is the mystery of Christ in us, both for the Jew and the Gentile. And that's Colossians 1, 26 through 27. It says, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages, ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. See how the mystery is something that's revealed. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here it is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a marvelous mystery that one is. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And it's, it's um, the parable from Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 10. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and he said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So there's this mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And I mean, you could go into a study of each one of these and it would be very rich and very full. And then is the mystery of godliness from 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. 
God was manifested in the flesh. Now, this is a mystery. Jesus um, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to glory. And this is the mystery of godliness. But number eight, and I love that it's number eight. I put it in number eight because number eight is the number of redemption. And this has to do with new beginnings. I believe that the mystery that is being spoken of here in Revelation chapter 10 is summed up in the idea of the redemption. And so I'm going to read to you a portion of scripture that is headed redemption in Christ from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 14. And this too is a paraphrase because it's easy to understand because it's, there's some very complicated principles. So I'm saying write that down and take it home and look at the real scripture and, um, and study that because there's such, um, such blessing in studying our redemption. It's just, it's just a blessing. So it says this in verse 7. Visualize this. His blood freely flowing down the cross, setting us free. We are forgiven for our sinful ways by the riches of his grace, which he poured all over us with all wisdom and insight, he has enlightened us to the great mystery at the center of his will with immense pleasure. He has laid out his intentions through Jesus, a plan that will climax when the right time comes as he returns to create order and unity, both in the heaven and on earth. When all things are brought together under the anointed royal rule. In him we stand to inherit even more. As his heirs, we are predestined to play a key role in his unfolding purpose that is energizing everything to conform to his will. As a result, we, the first to place our hope in the anointed one, will live in a way to bring him glory and praise. Because you too have heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and because you believed in the one who is truth, your lives are marked with his seal. This is none other than the Holy Spirit who, has pr who was promised. As a guarantee towards the inheritance we are to receive when he frees and rescues all who belong to him, to God be all praise. So I believe that that is, in this context, that number eight, redemption, is the mystery that they're speaking about here in the book of Revelation. And God is telling us that he is going to finish his plan for the end of the age. And he says that he's already told us about this, these mysteries because he spoke them to his servants, the prophets. I love this word here. It says that he declared this to his servants, the prophets, because this word declare is young on gay lizo, which is a Greek word um, that we use as the good news or the gospel. So that's the declaration that he's declaring is the gospel. And Amos tells us something very interesting. He says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So we're going to, um, next time we meet together, we're going to do a little side topical on prophets and prophecy. Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in our society and within the church. There's um, a lot of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, um, bantering back and forth about what is the truth of prophets and prophecy. And so I think that we need to kind of look at that a little bit and examine it. So now what's going to happen next is something that's really interesting is John is going to eat this little book. What I love about what's happening here is John is no longer going to be a bystander in this vision. John is going to be a participant. God is God has so far just asked John to listen and to watch and to write. But now God is going to allow him to eat the word and he is going to have to become 
a doer of that word that he is going to eat. It says this, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the book. And then he took that book and he ate it. And it says that it was bitter in his stomach, but it was sweet in his mouth. This is really interesting because we know throughout Scripture, the Word of God is said to be food for our soul. Job says this in Job 23, 12. He says, I have not departed from your commands. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than necessary food. So Job is saying this was nourishment. The word of God was nourishment to him. Jeremiah, along the same line in chapter 15, says, Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me a joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Oh, the word is delicious to those who believe. Ezekiel 2.8 says this, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of the book was in it. Then I spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were laments and mourning and woe. Then in chapter 3 it says, Moreover he said to me, Son of man, Eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it, and in, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. And then we know Jesus himself tells us, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God's word is exciting. That revelation of God's word is wonderful. But as we look in this book of Revelation, and we look at the judgment that is to come, as we digest this word, it will become sour in our stomachs. Sometimes, especially in the area of judgment, God's word is bitter sweet. And that's what's being said here as John eats this scroll. And then it says, and he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. What I love about this is it's telling us that this is not just for the church. This is for many people, nations, tongues, and kings. This is for all men. You see, what is happening here and what is going to happen in the end times is not just a message to the church. It is a message to the entire world because it has to do with the fate of the entire world. I don't know if you've noticed, but I have noticed recently in the entertainment field how many secular movies television shows documentaries are focused on the apocalyptic end time themes i don't know if you've noticed it but it is amazing they are just multiplying at a fast rate and what this tells me is not only is the church restless the world is restless there is something they can feel that there is something coming and rightfully so because there is so i wanted to say to those that may not know jesus when the battle comes whose side do you want to be on do you want to be on the lord's side or do you want to be on the enemy's side because you see there's only two choices there's no in-between. There's only two choices. And I just pray that you choose to be with God in the battle. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just praise you. We praise you for your word, Lord, that we could partake of it, eat of it, Lord, and that it just becomes life to us, Father. Lord, I just um, lift up those who have heard this message this evening, Lord, that do not know you. I pray that they would weigh on the side of the Lord, Lord, and that they would not be lost to the enemy. We love you, Lord, and we praise you, and we lift this evening to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.